Hello, I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. And this is Triple Play, that podcast where we nuke the fridge. Because this month we watched Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Written by David Kopp and George Lucas and Jeff Nathanson, I guess, are credited with the story. Yeah, and directed by Steven Spielberg. And released on May 22nd, 2008 in the U.S. and a couple of days before that in, at, in a film festival in France. Yeah, yeah. At the Con, I think that's how you pronounce it, film festival. I always pronounce it Ken, but I don't I'm, actually know how it's pronounced, so I might be completely wrong on that. Also, I thought it was David Kep and not Cop. But maybe yeah, that's, that's probably true. Also, me not knowing how to pronounce names, maybe. so. Yeah, so this movie was made like how many years 19. after? It's 19. Ni- 19 years after Last Crusade and also takes place 19 years after Last Crusade for Indiana Jones. Which it should have because Harrison Ford was 19 years older <laughs> when they filmed it. And Although Steven Spielberg, uh, maybe it was either Spielberg or Lucas came out and said like, yep, it looks just like they made it right after. Um, yeah, it was Lucas. I read that. Right after Last Crusade, which is kind of true, mm-hmm. except for Indiana Jones himself looks 20 years older. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's a big thing, though. Yeah. Well, so let's just very briefly explain the plot because the plot went through a lot of interesting developments behind the scenes but i think it's good to start with where the plot ended up and then we can go back and talk about where it started it's basically the rough outline of the plot is that these russians are trying to experiment with like psychic warfare so they want to find this crystal skull that the americans have locked up in a warehouse or this alien from the end presumably the warehouse from the end of raiders of the lost ark we see actually see the the Ark in one of these boxes, although Mm -hmm. maybe it was just moved there or something. I don't know. Yeah, that's actually the same prop as Raiders of the Lost Ark. Apparently, George Lucas hung onto it, and security was heightened the day that they had that prop on set because a lot of people wanted wanted to make off with it because it's basically a piece of cinematic history at that point, right? Anyway, so they capture Indiana Jones. He finds this alien body for them in the warehouse, and then he escapes... And eventually, over the course of the movie, he's looking for this other crystal skull that his buddy Oxley right. found. And Ox had like an apprentice type he, guy. So Ox, I think what it was, so we meet Mutt and Mutt is He's Indiana Jones' son yeah. with uh, Marion from the first movie. Yeah. And Ox, uh, so but Mutt, he does, Mutt but he says- he doesn't know that. And Indiana yeah. doesn't know that. Mutt says that his dad died in the war, World War II, and Ox kind of raised him because Ox was a good friend of both his dad and right. his mom. Right, that's, that's also why the Russians are the villains in this, because it's in the 50s, so. Yeah. And so Indiana Jones joins up with Mutt, and they go looking for this crystal skull, and they find it, and they find Marion, and there's a lot of chase scenes, which I'm sure we might talk about later. And then they get to the temple, they return the crystal skull, they find out the aliens. temple was an interdimensional spaceship. Yeah. So that's like the rough outline of the plot. And we explained it in like two minutes, but that's pretty much mostly what happens. There's a chase sequence through the college, which occurs right when yeah. Indiana meets Mutt. Yeah, there are a couple of chase sequences in this. And, you know, the, the plot sounds really simple when we explain it like that. But mm-hmm. the, the older Indiana Jones movies also, I think a lot of this episode is going to be me sort of defending this, even though I thought it was, I did think it was the weakest out of the four movies. Um, but a, a lot of the other Indiana Jones movies had a pretty simple plot too, maybe a few more twists and turns than this one had. I mean, yeah, I thought it was the weakest of the movies, but I didn't think it was a bad movie. No, I didn't think it was bad at all. I think uh, this gets a lot of uh, negative, I think I think people bag on this a lot and dislike it harshly uh, maybe not fairly i don't know i don't know well so basically the genesis of the plot actually happened like way back after like right after lost crusade where george lucas was like we should do something with aliens well i mean we mentioned this uh, before but george lucas originally was like there's gonna be five indiana jones movies all right and it turns out he hadn't like done the work for five movies so he was like nah look there's only gonna be three it's gonna be the show young Mm -hmm. indiana jones adventures well, so Paramount wanted to do a fourth movie and George didn't. He wanted to do the show. So he went off and did the show, but he also had this idea for the fifth movie. And the reason why he didn't end up wanting to do the fifth movie was because Steven Spielberg said he didn't want to direct a fourth movie. He would probably just produce it. And also, he, Steven Spielberg wasn't sold on the idea that George brought to him, which was Aliens. Yeah, Harrison Ford, I think, didn't really care for the Aliens idea either. Yeah, I think it turns I, out fans didn't like it either when this I movie think came out. The reason why Spielberg didn't want to do Aliens was because he was doing 
E.T. and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So he'd done a lot of aliens around that time. So he didn't want to do another alien movie. E.T. was almost 10 years before this. I mean, yeah, but Spielberg wanted to branch out and do other ideas, which is also why he said he wouldn't direct the next Indiana Jones movies because he wanted to move on. There was also, I think Spielberg was like, I want to do, he wanted to, he wanted to mature. That was his, that's his own word, mature. Mm -hmm. And I think he wanted to show people that he could put out what his definition of mature movies because well you see like in the 90s he puts out movies like the color purple and schindler's list actually i don't know when the color purple came out Mm -hmm. maybe maybe it's early 90s or late 80s but then schindler's list also is like late 90s i think yeah so that's something he wanted to move on to rather than like indiana jones and stuff like that yeah but i think i think now he's i think now as in present day he's kind of struck a balance between the two because he just made the post which was like a really heavy political movie but then immediately after he releases ready Ready player ready player one which i saw and actually really liked i thought it was a really good movie surprisingly well well i read the book of that and that was like it was all right i guess i think the movie's better than the book if i'm going to be honest that might be a controversial opinion but i think the movie's better than the book i mean the book wasn't like held up as like a great book anyway so some people really like the book but yeah i think he's like struck a balance now between doing those Heavier movies, but also doing the lighter stuff. I mean, his next movie is Indy 5, though, so... 2020, Indy 5. Which will be 12 years after Indiana Jones 4, which, if they follow the timeline, that means it'll be set in 1969. I think they already confirmed, also, they're not bringing Shia back. I think they... I think I so. I think they did, yeah. Which is good, in my opinion, because I think Shia LaBeouf was probably the, the weakest part of this movie, but we'll get into that. I didn't think he was, like, overtly bad, but there was a lot of delivery... A lot of his deliveries were really questionable, and I do think he was the weakest part of the movie. I thought he detracted from the movie. Shia LaBeouf also kind of went off the deep end a couple of years ago. So, <laughs> anyway, George shelved the idea for the aliens for a while, but then eventually, apparently, there was like a meeting between Steven Spielberg and George Lucas and Kathleen Kennedy and, and Harrison Ford, and they were like, "Oh, we really want to do like an Indiana Jones movie again because those were a lot of fun. Let's do another one." So George was like, "Okay, what about aliens?" <laughs> The History Channel guy, <laughs> and they were like, "Okay, I guess." And he's like, "We can use the crystal skull to like ground." We didn't mention that the movie. We didn't mention that there were some there were were actually some working scripts for some Indiana Jones movies that had aliens mm-hmm. written in the nineties by I don't remember some guy I don't remember who wrote them. Uh, I don't think anyone involved with the original Indiana Jones movies, mm-hmm. but those were out there. They never did anything with them though, except use some elements like the ants thing i think was something they came up with in the 90s and ended up using in mm-hmm. this movie yeah so lucas suggests grounding the film with the the crystal skulls which apparently he'd wanted to do ever since he claims he's wanted to do ever since like the last crusade and we wanted to do an episode of it for the young indiana jones adventures but like we said he didn't really have any of the legwork done for more than two movies for indiana jones so the validity of that statement is in question well i don't remember who said this but i remember when they're working on last crusade they were like oh man we've already had the ark of the covenant Mm -hmm. Uh, what are we going to put in this one to to be like the object of the search and they came up with the holy grail after like much trial and error yeah um but now they have the crystal skull which you know unlike the grail and the ark isn't like a a real world thing it's like a crystal skull there are actually crystal skulls it's a real world oh, object huh. i didn't know that and that's why george lucas was fascinated by it because there isn't really any explanation for them well there are huh. explanations All for right. them i don't yeah. know any of them but there that. are real crystal skulls that were found in south america to the best of my knowledge yeah but it is kind of like the temple of doom thing which is that yeah it's this real thing but they've twisted it a little bit and also it's not very well known like at all so yeah i didn't know it so then they they bring in a lot of people to do a lot of scripts and apparently there was one that steven spielberg really liked but the only thing he didn't like about it was that they were using like ex-nazis who hid out in argentina which was like a real thing by the way nazis who escaped a lot of nazis escaped to south america yeah, because it was, they weren't going to get... Because they thought it was off the map and they wouldn't be found. Turns yeah. out they were completely wrong. And Spielberg didn't feel like he could do... He could, like, pastiche Nazis anymore, especially after he made Schindler's List, which was, like, a very heavy Holocaust film. So he didn't feel like he could do Nazis ever again. He said they basically had done the Nazis to death at that point. He's like, all right, 
fifties. Who are we gonna do? Oh, I know Russians. Yeah, and also there apparently was some outcry about this from from, know, Russia. from Russia. I mean, un- understandably, I guess when your culture is made the villains, but but they're made the villains in like a lot of American yeah. things. But I guess this was a bigger one that's known on a worldwide scale. So yeah, and also apparently George Lucas wasn't sold on that script at all. He basically vetoed it, and Spielberg was like, "Okay, well, you write it then, and George." <laughs> actually did write, I think, the first draft of this movie or some some lengthy amount of story for this movie he I mean, wrote. I mean, I don't know how much of what George Lucas actually wrote and thought of himself made it into this, but there's some, like, obvious things. There are, I mean, there are obvious things in this that that come from George Lucas that you don't even have to know. You can just watch the movie and, like, oh, that comes from George Lucas. Like, there are some definitely Lucas questionable, idea. like, dialogue lines that are definitely George Lucas lines. <laughs> That made it into the movie. I can't even remember any examples right now, but I mean, just watch the movie yourself. You're like, oh, that's George Lucas right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They brought in David Kep to uh, write the final draft of the script. He's known for quite a few movies, actually. None that I can remember off the top of my head, though. I don't know any either. Well, it turns out he's the sixth most successful screenwriter of all time in terms of U.S. box office. Wow. Uh, he's done... Uh, well, he, was, he wrote Jurassic Park. He did a bunch of yeah, other that, movies that are go. probably really famous that I've never heard of. He did Mission Impossible. Okay. Uh, yeah, and recently he's done... Oh, he, he did the 2017 Mummy. He wrote the 2017 oh. Mummy. Pity that. <laughs> I heard that movie was garbage. Yeah, so Jurassic Park and Mission Impossible, those are the ones I was thinking of that I could He's done a lot more than I didn't name because I, mm-hmm. I didn't really recognize it, but I'm sure a lot of those are famous. And so he wrote the final draft of the script and then they... They got Harrison Ford back on board. He was like, yeah, I want to do another Indiana Jones movie. Because apparently he kept in shape after Lost Crusade because he was hoping for another four, for a fourth movie. So he just kept in shape for like 19 well, let's years. let's see. What did Harrison Ford really do that was big after Indiana Jones? Uh, I don't think I can really think of anything. We did Air Force One. Was that after Indiana Jones? I don't know. I, don't I want to say it what was. That is, really. It's like his most famous other movie, I guess. He played the president. Huh. Did he play the president or did he play the like vice president? I think he played the president. It's a movie where Air Force One gets c- captured by terrorists and the president has to like fight him off on the plane and Harrison Ford plays the main character. Huh. It's right. actually like kind of a fun movie. I've watched it. <laughs> but yeah, he's he's back. They they definitely keep the door open in this movie. Like, you know, hey, if this is really successful, you know, Shia might take over as the next Indiana Jones. And, you know, that obviously doesn't happen because the next Indiana Jones has Harrison Ford in it as Indiana Jones. And I think this is one of those things where, like, as long as he's alive, he's going to be Indiana Jones. I mean, he's pushing 80 now. <laughs> still Indiana Jones. So and that's a good thing. I would have, I'd, I'd rather have Harrison Ford back over Shia or probably anyone else any day. So, I mean, they could definitely do a... If, okay, if, maybe, if Harrison Ford was like 90-something, still wanted to do this, they could definitely do like a framing narrative where Indiana Jones is retelling the story of like a story from his younger days and they could cast a younger actor as, as Indiana Jones. And then it's not like a direct recasting. There's like a framing narrative of, of old Indy telling the story. I mean, maybe. Yeah, I mean, hmm, that would be a good idea if they, you know, once Harrison Ford uh, passes away or like if he doesn't, if they make an Indy six or whatever, mm-hmm. and he doesn't want to come back, probably be a better idea to have it set in his early days rather than, you know, pass the torch on to someone else. Yeah. But yeah, there's definitely the, we might pass the torch to Shia also moment because- at the end when the hat flies off the ca- hat rack and lands at Shia's feet and he's about to pull <laughs> Mutt's feet, feet and he picks it up and then Indy grabs it out of his hand and puts it on his head. And, and I mean, much real names, Indiana or uh, Henry, uh, Henry Jones the third. Like, come on, really? <laughs> well, apparently in the Indiana Jones TV show, he mentions having wanting to have a kid named Henry Jones the third or something like that. I read that somewhere that... Huh. It had been an idea since, like, the, the TV show. That, I mean, that's a trend for a lot of movies that George Lucas has worked on. You know, he comes up with all these ideas, and they only come into play, like, 20 years later. Happened with the prequels. A lot of the stuff in the prequels was created in the 70s. Yeah, he went off to make the prequels. Not sure when... how much of the Disney stuff was actually created before Disney came to Star Wars, but or bought Lucasfilm, but... I mean, from what I've heard, it. not a lot. Not a lot of it. Barely any of it, in fact. Yeah. But yeah, no, George Lucas went off to go make the prequels when Spielberg was like, I don't want to do 
aliens and then when he came after he finished the prequel spielberg was like okay sure we'll we'll do aliens quote unquote because <laughs> george lucas is like i sold steven on aliens by telling him they weren't extraterrestrial they were interdimensional i'm like well, okay okay there's a flying saucer at the end i was like <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> there's a funny line on the Wikipedia article which I was reading to learn about some of the production for this where it's like George Lucas was no uh, stranger to mixed reception thanks to the Star Wars prequels <laughs> well that must be the nicest way to say the prequels were basically uh, panned panned by fans still uh, better than Disney <clears throat> you think? yep absolutely you would put the prequel trilogy over episode seven or eight? Yep. All right. I mean, I strongly disagree with that, but <laughs> I guess we'll see how the Hans Solo movie does, which is really, if you think about it, a, a trial run for can we recast Indiana Jones if Harrison Ford kicks the can, so to speak. Because, <laughs> you know, they're recasting but, Han and, Solo. But again, that's, it's, it's Han Solo in his early days, so. Yeah. But I mean, the question is, is it going to work, right? Is it going to feel like Han Solo or is it going to feel like someone else playing Han Solo? It's the same thing we talked about on Doctor Who when Richard Herndahl was playing the first Doctor in The Five Doctors was like, yeah, he doesn't look that much like the first Doctor, but he gets most of the mannerisms down. Yeah. But it feels like Richard Herndahl playing William Hartnell playing the first Doctor and not the first Doctor, right? So the question is, in the Solo movie, is it going to be whatever the guy's name playing Harrison Ford playing Han Solo, or is it just going to be Han Solo? Well, we don't know yet. Yeah, we'll know at the end of May, I guess. Well, I won't. I'm not <clears throat> watching that movie. For, I'm going to put it off for as long as possible. Still haven't watched Rogue One. You should watch Rogue One at least once. At least that movie was good. Anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll watch it. Someone I know who's... And you don't actually know this person too. I'm not going to mention their name. Mm-hmm. Who's basically the, the one of the biggest and most critical Star Wars fans I know is like, yeah, Rogue One is the best thing Disney has put out for Star Wars. So high praise, mighty high praise. And this person hates seven and eight. So yeah, interesting. So yeah, so Harrison Ford decided he would do all of his own stunts this time because apparently safety had improved tenfold over the 19 years since he did Lost Crusade. <laughs> I mean, then again, you can go watch behind-the-scenes videos for the original Indiana Jones movies, and like I mentioned before, you can just see people on, like, hydraulic jump things just looking like they have no protection, no uh, harness, nothing, just being shot up into the air. So, Yeah, well, I think stunt actors got a lot more... Rights is not exactly the word, but protections, I think, is the word over the years since then. Well, a funny thing I noticed in this is, and I didn't look up any behind-the-scenes things for this, so this is just what's, what I saw on screen, is all the sh- uh, scenes where Shia does the knife, or Mutt does the knife tricks, are, mm-hmm. like, zoomed in on the knife and you don't see his face, and, like, it pans up, and, like, as soon as the knife gets off screen, you, that's when you see Shia's face. I was like, hmm. all right, it's probably, you know, someone else doing the knife tricks. Yeah, possibly. But I know Spielberg wanted to do as many practical effects as possible to avoid CG and also to capture the feeling of the the original. And he said he was surprised by the amount of CG they actually ended up having to do in the end. Like the sword fight and the ants get a lot of criticism for there being you know, a lot of CG. But that sword fight was actually performed on the beds of those trucks. And then the only CG in that scene is the leaves in front of the camera. Huh. Yeah, and I know Spielberg also um, wanted to do this on film. Unlike mm-hmm. George Lucas, who was like, no, nah, no, nah, we should do it on digital, like the, the prequels. But that didn't end up happening. Yeah, because I think Spielberg was trying as much as possible to replicate the style of the first three movies. And the first three movies were shot on film. And that's also the cinematographer for this movie, who I'm going to look up his name. because it should be mentioned, I guess. The cinematographer J- Jan- Janus Kaminsky. Janus Kaminsky basically spent months studying Douglas Slocombe's work on the first three Indiana Jones movies so that he could get similar lighting and similar camera effects and film grading for this movie so that it would look in line with the other three movies. And I know Steven Spielberg, like we said in our episode on the trilogy, always tries to direct movies with like a new eye and tries to, doesn't try to have like the Steven Spielberg style. He tries to make each movie fit what the movie should be and he said that he had to swallow his pride and try to emulate young Steven Spielberg when he was directing this movie because otherwise it wouldn't have looked right he wanted it to look in style with the other ones so which once again is why there were so many practical effects the ant scene gets a lot of I guess flack because it looks pretty CG'd and 
yeah, I mean, it kind of is. All those ants are CG mostly, so. I thought it looked good. That was one of the few scenes, because I, I haven't, I'd only watched this once. I hadn't seen this since it first came out in theaters. Mm -hmm. That was one of the few scenes I remembered from this, and I was surprised at how much I actually forgot about this. Yeah, I was surprised at how much I forgot about though, this so. movie, too. One of the one of my criticisms with this movie is that, you know, the first three movies, we talked about how the first 20 minutes or whatever the movie felt like the ending to a different movie and how that was, like, super intentional. It was supposed to feel like you're watching Indy finish his previous adventure and then start his new one. And in this movie, it doesn't feel so much like that. I mean, it kind of does because Indy, when he first shows up, he's been captured and he's under guard of the Russians. And then you could argue that the first, I guess, cliffhanger scene because it's supposed to be like an adventure seal. The first quote-unquote cliffhanger is when the fridge gets nuked and then he walks away from that. You could argue that that's the first one, but it doesn't feel as separate or, or like the other three. Or when What's-His-Face pulls the gun on Indy. Yeah. Possibly. It doesn't feel as... It doesn't feel as separate because it's separate. A, because this is the, this introduces the, the villain, which mm -hmm. is, I forget her name, but... Spalco. Yeah. But on the other hand, I mean... I guess we can transition now into talking about some of the main points of contention for this movie because there mm -hmm. were a lot. On the other hand, the other Indiana Jones movies um, definitely set up the sort of fantastical elements of it, but not not as much as this one. This is why I find it kind of weird re-watching re this, that people dislike the alien stuff so much because it's right there in the beginning. Yeah, because the uh, very first shot of the alien body, it says Roswell, New Mexico <laughs> on the side. And she said, this is from 10 years ago. And if you know anything about UFOs, you know that people claim a UFO crashed in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. So right from the very first instant the villain shows up, aliens are part of the story. Yeah, and I mean, I think this movie, possibly even more so than the other three Indiana Jones movies, if you come into the Indiana Jones franchise like Clean, not knowing anything about it, this is probably the one that indicates to you the most that there's going to be super, supernatural elements like within the first five to ten minutes. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say, maybe the, you know maybe this movie wasn't trying to emulate that action-adventure serial style that the first three were because I think this movie was trying to emulate or send up a lot of the tropes of like 1950s B-movie science fiction things, things, things like War of the Worlds that were like kind of cheesy and over-the-top in terms of the aliens and the science fiction aspect and they were trying to send that up more in this movie than the adventure serials of the previous three so it's supposed to feel like a very different movie i think in that aspect but at the same time supposed to feel connected to the the previous three yeah sure i mean spielberg said that when they were designing the movie and writing the script that they because they knew they were going to be setting it in the 50s they were trying to emulate those 50s style movies it's interesting also that they introduced this idea that <laughs> Indiana served in World War II because World War II happens between Lost Crusade and this movie. Yeah, it's a little weird. Where that it they, happens at the end of it's, Lost it's, Crusade. and It was a little weird that Indiana Jones was a spy in this or that like he had worked as a spy. Yeah. I didn't see that as something his original character would have done, but, you know, whatever. I, it's not a big part of this movie. No. So... But I think is another big thing, another big point of contention for this. And this is one that I'll actually say is kind of justified because I thought he was the worst part of the movie. I think Mutt fails because of Shia LaBeouf, though. I actually yeah. like the concept of Mutt, I, you know, because Spielberg was saying how they designed Mutt to be like Indiana was to his father, basically everything his father hates <laughs> in a son. So Mutt was designed to be loud and, you know, he dropped out of school and he drives motorbikes and he all he cares about is his hair and it's supposed to be everything that Indiana hates yeah, to draw of, that parallel between... I mean, kind of works coming off of Last Crusade, especially that scene um, where you find out that Henry Jones the first is dead now. Mm -hmm. so. And but, yeah, I think Mutt fails because of Shia. Like, you know, Mutt's still a pretty smart character when they're in the tomb. He has a lot of good ideas. He, You know, he notices that the boot prints are the same size, so it's probably only one person who went in and came out. And Indy's like, yeah, that's a good point, Mutt. And Mutt helps him out when he's in Ox's, I guess, room at the insane asylum trying to decipher the words in the wall. So, like, Mutt's, I think, is a good character. I think he fails because Shia LaBeouf maybe doesn't know how to deliver the lines or just didn't know what he was doing with the part. Yeah, the, the, the acting is pretty bad. The, the scene where they're in the diner, there's a noticeable... Sh Shia changes his voice, like, mid-scene. It's noticeable. Mm -hmm. Which, this was actually weird to me because I watched Holes a couple months ago, the Disney movie, mm -hmm. and that star Shia LaBeouf as well this was when he was like 12 years old and I thought he I didn't think he was bad in that I didn't no, think he was bad at all but it was it, weird to me too because I watched Fury 
about a year or two ago and Shia is basically fantastic in Fury. He's basically like one of the three best actors in that movie and that's a movie full of good actors. So when I was watching this, I was like, man, Shia really phoned it in on this, didn't he? And I mean, I don't think we'll ever, we'll ever have like a real explanation as to why because he's shown mm-hmm. to be a good actor in other movies. But I mean, it's probably a combination of him being in an Indiana Jones movie and maybe just his style of acting not gelling well with Spielberg's style of directing. Yeah. I mean, and I know Shia made comments afterwards about him not, you know, really liking how Spielberg directed the movie or at least insinuating that he didn't like how Spielberg directed the movie. And then that's basically really soured the relationship between Spielberg and and Shia, which is also part of the reason why Shia is probably not coming back for Indy 5. Yeah. Yeah. Another point of contention is that alien scene at the end, people like, that's just over the top is what I've heard. And I was like, eh, whatever. It doesn't really bother me, especially I, when there was a scene in the first movie where God comes down and strikes down the Nazis. Yeah, the the face melting, I mean, huh. I, yeah, I, I never considered this to be out of place with the other Indiana Jones movies. Uh, I don't really see why that's an argument. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I think people were just tired of aliens, probably. They were like, well, it, it probably feels like aliens is really tropey, whereas something like the Ark of the Covenant or the Holy Grail when the first indie movies were made were unique and not really done not really done a lot before but aliens is like every year there's like 10 movies at least that come out that involve (laughs) aliens in some way right you don't hear about all of them because not all of them are blockbusters and not all of them are well marketed but every year most of them are pretty bad too (laughs) yeah most of them are pretty bad but every year there's a movie involving aliens right so you know you get indiana jones you're like yeah indiana jones what are they going to do when it's aliens and you're like okay yeah, I can see that. Aliens and Russians being sort of just like, well, all right. You should, yeah. Two big villains in a lot of movies, aliens and Russians. So. Yeah, but I think they had to go with the Russians, especially yeah, since the movie was set in 57. That's what Spiel- Spielberg said, at least. You know, you look at 1957 in American history, you're like, who are the big bads in the American public consciousness? And it was the Russians. It was communism. Yeah. And, and there's, even there's still in pro- the 60s. You can see so. in the movie there's a protest in the school. The the better red than dead signs and, mm-hmm. or better dead than red. Yeah, God. Better dead than red. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I thought the middle of the movie kind of dragged as well. The the puzzles and the clues and stuff seemed a little weaker than the other Indiana Jones movies. I actually okay. was fine with the puzzles. The part of the movie that dragged to me and the part of the movie that I was watching this in bed and was trying it was pretty close to putting me to the sleep was actually the chase scene i thought the chase scene just huh. wasn't well paced in my opinion i i actually like this a lot more than well the tank part of the last crusade hmm. that's interesting i don't know i just felt like the chase scene i felt like they spent too much time in the jungle just driving through the jungle because we get you know they escape from the camp and then we get they're driving through the jungle and they try to get the skull and then shia gets caught on a vine and then shia is flying around with monkeys and then he lands on the other <laughs> car and then there's the sword fight and the fighting and then indy switches cars and ox switches cars and then the skull ends up in indy's car and then they finally then make it to the anthill part yeah see i mean i liked all of that but i think it suffers a lot in the same way last crusade did where like the chase scene is really long and at that point you just want the movie to be over like in 10 minutes when it's done mm-hmm. and this one again like last crusade still has like 20 to 25 minutes after that I mean, but unlike Last Crusade, to me anyway, the part after the chase scene actually felt like it went pretty quick. Like it was paced really well and felt like it went by really huh. fast. I'm the exact opposite. After that scene was done, I was like, oh God, this is taking forever. Yeah, because after that scene, they just, they go into the temple, they put the skull down and they leave. That's kind of all that happens after that. Uh, Spalco comes in, but then she gets her brain fried well, by I the mean, alien. There's the ant stuff. Then they go down the waterfalls and they're chased by the that group in the temple. And then they have to figure out the, the obelisk thing. Then they finally get into the alien room. Yeah, well, but first all that the felt like it room. went by pretty quick to me. Uh, I don't not know. to me, but, you know, whatever. I don't know. Spielberg apparently specifically fi- hired an editor who wouldn't make super quick cuts like was really common in 2008. <laughs> he wanted the... And it's still pretty common, I think. Yeah, it is. He wanted the, the pace of the movie to come from the script and the acting and the action and not from the cuts in the movie, which is fair, I think. I think it worked most of the time. Most yeah, of the time. I wasn't a fan of the banter between Indy and uh, Marion, honestly. But what are you going to do, right? I mean, I don't have much to comment on that. I thought it was nice that they brought back Marion from Raiders. Because in a way, if they never made an Indiana Jones movie, this movie does have some nice 
connecting threads back to Raiders that kind of serve as a concluding note to the franchise. Marion and Indy end up getting married at the end. And I think that, you know, that ties in nicely with the first movie. I think it, I, I mean, I think I was, if that was the complete franchise, I think that would be a good ending. I mean, I was fine with that. I just didn't think any of their banter was, I, like a lot of the jokes didn't really, I didn't really care. Even uh, Same thing with Ox too. I didn't really care for any of the quote unquote humorous scenes with him. I liked the ones with Ox. I think the ones with Marion suffer from the fact that it feels like you're listening to in jokes that you're not privy to. <laughs> so you're like, should I be laughing right now or should I be questioning? Should you know, because Marion's talking about how or... she married like some dude named David Williams or whatever Williams and Indy's right, like, well, like, I introduced yeah. you. And she's like, "That doesn't. you don't have a say in how many people and who I get married to when you left me. Yeah, which like as a viewer, you have no context for like any of this. So whatever. Hmm. I still think this is a, a good movie. The, definitely the weakest Indiana Jones for me, but uh, I I'd still recommend it. I, guess. I mean the weakest, yeah. But I still I I agree. I still think it's a good movie. I think it's unfairly hated by people who just were looking for something to hate almost. Yeah, because I mean it's not even that different than the old ones. I can see people. No. I, I can see people complaining if it's like really different, but it's just not. Yeah, no, it's definitely in line with the previous three. It's, it's definitely got the same creative threads running through it and it definitely has the same dna in it i think you know wikipedia is even like this movie received a very polarizing but mostly positive reception <laughs> i was like uh okay that's putting it lightly but overall yeah i would recommend it i am looking forward to indiana jones 5 yeah I'm i am too not actually gonna lie. i barely look forward to movies but i'm looking forward to indiana jones 5 you know, I'm looking forward to see what kind of artifacts they pull out for that one, what kind of ideas they pull out for that, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd say at the end here is if you want another good Indiana Jones story, in my opinion, play the video game, uh, uh, something Indiana Jones and the... Uh, I don't remember what it's called, but it involves China. It involves <laughs> Indy going to China, and uh, it, it involves some, some sort of Chinese tomb, and I don't know, I, I played the game as a kid, and I thought it was... A, pretty good game and pretty good story so that's the only other thing i guess i would recommend here because we're closing the book on indiana jones now and we're moving on so you can email us at the doctor at decadentvegetable.com questions comments concerns angry rants love letters your thoughts on indiana jones and the kingdom of the crystal skull you can find us on youtube at decorative vegetable you can find us on apple podcasts and google play at triple play be sure to leave a rating if you like the show Check us out on Facebook, Trust Your Doctor, like us on Facebook. Also check us out on Twitter, at TYD Podcast, and follow us on Twitter. And next time we're watching the Oceans Trilogy, but until then, the end. Mm-hmm.